Lovely to see everybody. Welcome. A really good evening to you all and a warm welcome to the latest of our debates held as always in partnership with TES. And thanks so much for joining us, whether by travelling into the IOE or, of course, joining us online. Now, you won't be surprised to hear that the issues about how schools are held to account has come up in a number of our debates to date, including the debate on how best to support schools in challenging circumstances, and all the way through to our recent debates on assessment and the school curriculum. So this has been a hotly uh, requested topic for our debate series, and one that we wanted to address in its own right. It's also very topical, of course, because Ofsted's currently consulting on a new inspection framework, as you all know, one which could depart in significant ways from the current approach. So we can take a look at accountability in the round, I think, um, both inspection but also performance indicators and performance tables, and we can perhaps take a particular look at Ofsted's proposals for change as well. I think few people would argue for an end to accountability, and most would say that accountability measures have had some positive influence on the school system. Equally, the nature of those measures and the impact that they've had on schools, school leaders and teachers, as well as on pupils themselves, has generated widespread and wide-ranging concern. They've variously been blamed for narrowing the curriculum, an instrumental approach to learning, a decline in well-being for pupils and staff, and of course, a knock-on to recruitment and retention of teachers, and indeed to the recruitment and appointment of head teachers who often bear particular responsibility. So the question this leaves us with is whether schools can be held to account in a way that supports high standards, but avoids the sorts of pitfalls that I've just been mentioning. And we have a very sage expert panel to help us think through that question. Um, and I hope that they'll get lots of challenge from the audience. But before I move on to introducing our panelists, I'll make my usual housekeeping announcements and also pose a question to you. So first of all, on the housekeeping, we're not expecting a fire drill, so if the alarm sounds, please do take the doors out behind you onto Bedford Way, and anyone who can't use the stairs should move to the doors on the audience's left, and you'll be shown out uh, to an alternative route out of the building. For tweeters among you, the hashtag, as usual, is hash IOE debates, or one word, hash IOE debates, and that's the way that our live stream audience can put questions to the panel as well. So the question I want to ask you, I'm going to ask you for a show of hands, um, but uh, several options. So I'm going to ask you whether you, how, how frequently you think schools should be inspected. And the options are every two years, every four years, every six years, or never. So four options there. Show of hands for every two years. Okay, a few. Uh, show of hands for every four years. Hmm, quite a lot. Show of hands for every six years. A few. Show of hands for never. A couple. Okay, very useful. That's a really good starting point for us, I think. And very informative for the panel, too. So let's go to the panel. Um, on my far left, we have Jeff Barton, who's been General Secretary of ASCOL, the Association of School and College Leaders, since April 2017. And immediately prior to that, from 2002, he was head teacher of King Edward VI School in Bury St Edmunds. He's founding fellow of the English Association, patron of the English and Media Centre, and a leading thinker for the National Education Trust. He's worked with various organisations on le leadership and literacy, including the Department for Education. And, of course, ASCOL recently facilitated the Ethical Leadership Commission, which reported just a, week, a couple of weeks ago, with which I was involved too, and, of course, which was addressing some of these issues for uh, uh, school leaders. Then on my immediate left, I have Nick Brooke, who's Deputy General Secretary of the National Association of Head Teachers. 
Prior to working at the NAIT, he read, ran his own successful education consultancy, building on 25 years' experience in central government, including at the Home Office, what was the, tra the training and development agency for schools, and at Ofsted and also in local government and schools. And at Ofsted, Nick led thematic and subject inspection and external communications. So he's absolutely expert in the issues today. And of course, he also chaired the Nate Accountability Commission, which reported last September. And then at the other end of the table, we have Ed Dorrell, who probably needs no introduction at these debates. He's Tez's deputy editor and head of content, and he often joins the audience for these debates and asks some very insightful questions, <laughs> as you'd expect from the deputy editor of the Tez. And I'm delighted that this time he's made it up on the stage as a panellist. <laughs> Ed's career in journalism started on local papers and trade titles, and he's been at the Tez for more than 10 years, starting out there as news editor. And alongside, he's contributed to national newspapers, books, television and radio. And then we have Natalie Pereira, who's executive director and head of research at the Education Policy Institute, EPI, as we know it. Natalie joined EPI in 2015, prior to which she worked in the Department for Education from 2002 to 2014, and spent time also at the Cabinet Office. And among the many programmes that she's worked on while at the DfE, Natalie led on research and policy interventions to narrow the gap between disadvantaged children and the rest. So you can see what a distinguished panel we have. Uh, and without any further ado, I'm going to turn <coughs> to Ed to start us off. Ed. Thank you, Becky. Um, first of all, I would like to ask for your sympathies. Um, I've just come off the back of three weeks of paternity leave. Um, I have baby brain. I have a caveman beard. Um, I have literally no idea what's happened in education policy in the last three weeks. So if there's been a big step change in accountability in the last three weeks and I've failed to mention it, you now know why. And if I suddenly just disappear, my brain drifts off, that's also why. Um, anyway, <clears throat> so let's look at the subject of this debate. What if we struck a different balance between school autonomy and regulation? by which I'm taking to mean accountability. Our first glance, this seems something of an impossible paradox. It's impossible to resolve. And yet, it is the central uh, policy dilemma of UK education since Ruskin, really, in 1976, the famous Callaghan speech. Well, attempting to resolve it politically over the last 40 years, if you look at the history, sometimes reminds me of Einstein's definition of madness um, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different outcomes. In thinking, however, in thinking about this debate, I have come to the conclusion that we have spent the last 40 years looking at the wrong problem, possibly in the wrong place. I shall come to what I mean by that later. Um, the first point to be made is, if it's not too obvious, this isn't just an education debate, this is a political debate. The drive to greater autonomy for the last 30 years <coughs> has never really been about autonomy at all. In 2001 under Blair, in 1988 under Baker, in 2010 under Gove, driving school autonomy was and is an attempt to break perceived closed shop practices and perceived left-wing blobs, or left-wing madrasas, as Michael Gove famously didn't say. Um, proof of it, if it were needed, is the speed by which uh, this Conservative government, the same government that has driven forward academisation under the banner of school autonomy, has embraced the multi-academy trust model of school governance, which in many cases, not exclusively, but in many cases, has been the biggest driver against school autonomy this country has probably ever seen. Um, you look at examples like Outward Grange Academy Trust, aka OGAT, where the head teacher is effectively uh, relegated to a role of um, Sergeant Major, I suppose. Um, the, uh, the head isn't even allowed to decide the colour of the walls, the school uniform, let alone such things as school finance or um, curriculum. It is also worth noting that most successful heads, not most, many successful heads who've been around a long while 
would suggest that in fact academization hasn't driven any more autonomy or very little more autonomy than was experienced by heads who were prepared to take risks under the system of, of known as local management of schools. Um, I would argue therefore autonomy is a mirage really. Further evidence of this comes in the form of Nick Gibb, schools minister for uh, the last 455 years, who <laughs> purports to support academization, will passionately speak in favor of it, and yet seemingly would like to control um, every aspect of primary education on an hour, seemingly hour by hour basis. Um, there is an additional problem to autonomy, of course. When it is allowed to flourish in this country, too often we see uh, frankly, we see way too many examples of gaming, off-rolling, related party transactions, embezzling, corruption, the list goes on and on. Uh, that is not to say it's all schools by any stretch, but autonomy, when actually allowed to flourish, has exact, hasn't exactly covered itself in glory. Uh, moving to the other side of this debate's paradoxical uh, subject, accountability and the regulation of schools, too often... Uh, we look at this, uh, we approach this subject from the wrong direction. Accountability is the wrong word, I would argue, for the construct of controls that scaffold schools. Ofsted, league tables, DfE, etc. are in essence about political control, not about accountability. The word accountability itself suggests something um, quite simple, really. Perhaps that the billions of pounds spent in schools uh, are spent the public can be reassured that that money is spent uh, by professionals in a good way, doing a reasonably good job. That would be what accountability should really mean. But instead, it's about what Sam Freeman, uh, former Michael Gove advisor, uh, now reinvented as a great liberal, liberal metropolitan, um, refers to, uh, what he refers to as uh, the levers of power that politicians have over schools. That is what accountability is really about. Politicians, Baker, Blair, Gove, etc., recognise the truth that, uh, that many teachers would like to, well, wouldn't like to hear, which is that education is political and therefore so is accountability. Uh, a good case study would be the introduction of the English Baccalaureate accountability measure, um, which is, uh, was driven by political interest, nothing wrong with it per se, but it is a political decision to introduce the EBAC and it has been used. Uh, it has uh, driven change in school. It's been a lever of power taken by the department that has introduced significant change in school. Um, and anyone who thinks that accountability isn't political could look at the way Ofsted is reinventing its inspection practices this year and has put EBAC squarely at the centre of it. Such when challenged, uh, that I hope this isn't a direct quote, but they said something along the lines of Ofsted inspects through the prism of, prism of government policy. So Ofsted is a political beast, whether they like it or not. <clears throat> All the measures uh, of accountability, uh, to a greater or lesser extent, are about making schools and teachers behave as politicians want them to. Paradoxically, as I've explained, so, um, so too is autonomy. So what should we do about this? Many in the education world would like to see a resolution to this debate that uh, looks something like teachers taking control of education through their own agency and through ownership of the evidence. Uh, they would like to see the profession throw off the chains of Ofsted, league tables and endless government structural reforms and, dri and drive towards the promised land of professional autonomy. This would of course be nice, but it is also hopeless, hopelessly, I would argue, ambitious, uh, overly ambitious and perhaps naive. I would perhaps argue that it's in fact flawed as an idea as well. Education will always be political and subject to enormous interest from politicians and their various accountability levers. Why is that? Well, because this is a democracy and teachers perform one of the most important roles within that democracy, the educating and moulding of future citizens. Um, in the process, they spend billions of taxpayers' money um, imparting uh, a selected and importantly edited body of knowledge. I would argue what could be more political. I, no, nothing could be more political than that. Um, and you contrast that with the NHS, uh, where doctors and um, hospitals spend millions, uh, but in large part their main responsibility is keeping millions of OAPs alive for a few more years. 
this is not as political at all as education. And the reason that the, the only really political bun fight in health is about spending. It's not about what doctors do. The reason doctors are allowed to get on with their jobs more than teachers, I would argue, is in part because what they do is not political. What teachers do is political, whether we like it or not. So what should we do? Um, what should institutions such as the IOE, the TES, NAHT, ASCL, even EPI, what, what should we argue in favour of? Uh, Okay, oh, sorry, forgive me. I thought I was going to be running very short. I've got one or two more things to say. Instead of attempting to draw a line over an, an, an imagined spectrum between autonomy and accountability, uh, we need to concentrate on building a confident, professionally proud generation of teachers and school leaders, ones that will engage with the political debate. A uh, profession that is a proud voice uh, and is prepared to take part in the bun fight that is politics in education. Perhaps then we couldn't push back against the worst excesses of political meddling and help build an accountability that is fit for purpose. Accountability model that is fit for, fit for purpose. As always in education debates, everything comes back to teacher self-efficacy. Schools must be done with rather than done to. The end. Sorry, I overran. Thank you, Ed. That's great. <laughs> Natalie. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to focus um, mostly on, sorry, can you hear me okay? Great. Um, I'm going to focus mostly on why the current accountability system has become problematic, both in terms of what we're measuring and how we're measuring it, how it rubs up against some of the wider challenges facing education today, and then how we might shift our focus to improve things. Um, so first, I think it's really important to make a clear distinction between regulation and accountability. And the way I look at it is that most people would agree we need some degree of regulation to safeguard pupils, to make sure that the people working with them are properly vetted, to make sure that the buildings they're in are safe and so on. But over the last few decades, we've, and, and definitely more recently, we've moved away from regulating the input of what schools are doing to making them more accountable for the outcomes of their pupils. So for example, we don't regulate things which we might consider rather important, like teacher CPD. And indeed now, half of pupils go to academies where there's no requirement at all for a qualified teacher. Now, most academies do employ qualified teachers, but, um, but they don't have to. But a focus on outcomes, on outcomes isn't necessarily a bad thing. Ultimately, it's the outcomes we care about the most. But it's those outcome measures, but, but the point is, the problem is that those outcome measures have over time become heavily focused on pupil attainment data. I'm a big fan of data, my organisation uses data, um, but even I would argue that we need to look again at that very heavy focus we have at the moment. Now, the Progress 8 measure that uh, the DfE and schools now use has balanced this to some extent, um, but not entirely. So we've done analysis in EPI, which shows that even when you control for prior attainment, so what children achieve at the end of primary school, disadvantaged pupils still, on average, make less progress than their peers, as do pupils with special educational needs. And Progress 8 doesn't really take account of these wider um, contexts and demographics. So the role of Ofsted, meanwhile, is typically to look more widely than the raw performance data. <laughs> But again, our research has found that there um, has been an inherent bias in Ofsted judgments. And we found that schools with more disadvantaged pupils <coughs> are less likely to be judged good or outstanding, while schools with low levels of disadvantaged pupils and high levels of, prior of high prior attaining pupils are much more likely to be rated highly. And again, even when you control for pupil progress. I'll come on to the new Ofsted framework in a moment, but essentially while elements of it are promising, it's not yet clear that that bias in judgments uh, that we observed will be eroded under the new framework. So a problem there with what we're measuring and how we are measuring it. Then 
the, the system that we've created of rewarding high attainment and penalising low attainment is operating, as I say, alongside other significant challenges facing schools today. And that's creating a, melt a melting pot of both problems and perverse incentives. The first challenge that uh, many schools are facing is funding. And we have a system where funding follows the pupil. It makes sense. The more pupils a school has, the more funding it has. But when it loses funding, uh, when it loses pupils rather, it also loses funding. So a poor Ofsted report and a fall in the, league, in the school league tables based on one year's worth of um, results can affect a school's ability to attract pupils and therefore it can threaten its financial sustainability. Another challenge is, of course, teacher recruitment and retention. And we know that specialist teachers are far less likely to work in disadvantaged schools, um, particularly outside of London. For example, in those most disadvantaged areas outside of London, only 17% of, pe of people teaching physics actually have a relevant degree in that subject. And we know that teacher turnover is higher in deprived areas um, compared to those in more affluent schools. So the current accountability measures can have a knock-on effect and really um, heighten the, um, the, prob the wider challenges that we see, particularly in relation to sustainability, a school's capacity to imp uh, improve and its ability to attract and keep great teachers. And so in order to avoid all that, we've made it very tempting, or at least the government has made it very tempting, for schools to set admissions criteria in ways that discourage low attaining or poorer families from applying to those schools, or they then exclude or off-world pupils who could well threaten their performance data. So where do we go from here? The DfE has helpfully streamlined its trigger for uh, intervening in schools by clarifying that formal intervention will only happen in the case of an inadequate Ofsted judgment. But that intervention that takes place is that the school will become an academy, or if it's already an academy, then it will be rebrokered and taken over by another academy trust. Again, we know from our own research and from others that becoming an academy isn't necessarily a silver bullet to school improvement. And while we also find that there have been some positive outcomes in rebrokering schools between multi-academy trusts, these improvements don't occur within all schools and they tend where they do happen to happen over a period of time and we can't yet identify um, the causation, so whether that is a result of being taken over by a new academy. Um, meanwhile, Ofsted is also consulting on a new framework which is intended to look more widely at the quality of education and the curriculum rather than focusing so heavily on performance data. And I think that most people would welcome this, as do I. Um, but as I say, I'm still not convinced that overall there won't continue to be a bias against disadvantaged pupils and those with SEND, and particularly in relation to some of the focus on behavioural standards. I mean, overall, I think the debate that we're having today is extremely timely. I visited earlier today Kensington Aldridge Academy. That's the school which um, is in the foothills of the Grenfell Tower and which tragically lost four of its pupils in the fire and with many more families deeply affected. What really struck me was the way in which the wider community came together, including other schools, to rally around the head teacher, the staff and the pupils to provide support. I worry that in the race to be the top of, to be at the top of the tables, we've lost or we're losing that sense of community and collaboration in our school system. So I think that we need to flip our incentives entirely. A successful accountability system, to me, should offer support, not punishment, to schools, support that's rooted in evidence and led by experienced leaders. It should incentivise collaboration, not competition, and it should encourage and re reward inclusion and not exclusion. Thank you. Nick. Right, well, I am told that outside of North Korea, uh, education system, our education system in this country is the most regulated in the world. Um, and I think from talking to many leaders in schools, many of them would agree with me from their own personal experience. Um, for most school leaders, 
autonomy or greater freedoms uh, and, and, and flexibilities are, are things that other people do uh, and is a world removed from the reality that they face. Their reality is a world where there is high stakes accountability that frankly dictates what they do when they do it and how they do it. So my contribution to this debate is therefore going to focus on precisely that. I'll be drawing on the findings of the Accountability Commission, uh, the reports of which I hope should be on your chairs. Now, it's, it's the 13th of February, folks. Uh, shops are shutting. If you haven't got a Valentine's gift yet, <laughs> may I suggest you take this away and wrap it up pretty sharpish. Uh, um, there are plenty, plenty around the room. Uh, take one for friends and family as well. Um, this report uh, was published in September last year, and in it, uh, the Accountability Commission have set out a new direction for the future of accountability. And it makes recommendations in the areas of use of pupil performance data, inspection, and school improvement. And for the purpose of this discussion, I'm going to focus in on uh, inspection and school improvement. But to start with, I'll give a very brief history of, of, of where we are. Now, just over 25 years ago, Ofsted and League Tables were created in tandem as a way of policing school standards in this country. And it's pretty much based on a, on a belief that at that point, failure was pretty endemic in the system. Roll forward to where we are now, and around 90% of schools are either good or better. Educational standards in this country have transformed over the last quarter of a century. However, in making a positive contribution, which Ofsted undoubtedly have done over the last 25 years, by identifying failure and prompting action to improve, we're now in a world where failure is in a very small minority. And the positive benefit that can be felt through Ofsted of identifying that failure is more than outweighed by the negative impact that is felt by the majority of schools that are neither failing nor struggling. Um, uh, but, but are constrained and feel straitjacketed by the systems that we put in place around them. So the first conclusion of the Commission uh, was that, on balance, the accountability system is doing more harm than good. Now, uh, you should also have a flyer which summarises, uh, on two pages, uh, the, the findings of the Commission. This one sets out seven ways in which the accountability system is doing harm. But let me articulate that in a, in a slightly different way for those people that haven't got access to this report. If we want a system to improve overall, you could argue that we need to make sure that we get great people in the right places doing the right things. And against those three tests, undeniably the accountability system is failing on all counts. We are losing far too many good people from education, either directly as a consequence of inspection by the falling foul of, of perhaps dodgy judgments at inspection, or indirectly as a consequence of the stress, anxiety, and workload that's been created uh, through accountability. We're failing to get the best people to schools which need the most. I spoke to many teachers and leaders as part of this review, many of whom told me that they were put off going to work in schools serving disadvantaged communities because they simply did not believe that they would be treated fairly by the inspectorate for doing so. And the work that Natalie's referred to here goes to suggest that there's good, strong evidence to show that that may well be the case. And in too many cases, we are incentivizing people to do the wrong things. I heard from far too many teachers and leaders who are undertaking activity which is frankly more to do with being Ofsted ready than having anything to do with improving teaching and learning in the classroom. So overall we concluded that uh, the system was doing more harm than good. So what needs to change? Well, as I mentioned, we make a recommendation around pupil performance data inspection and school improvement. Um, the Commission called for an honest reappraisal of the purpose uh, and, and capacity of the inspectorate. Like everyone else in education and in public service, the, ins uh, the inspectorate have got limited resources and resource constraints. Our belief was that they should focus their attention where they can make the greatest difference, and rather than spreading themselves too thinly. Um, we proposed that Ofsted should focus their attention on identifying failure in the system and providing a much stronger diagnostic insight to support those schools that are struggling so that they can get to good more rapidly. Now, it must be possible for any Ofsted inspector worth their salt, even on a short inspection, to quite rapidly identify those schools that are struggling. And likewise, it must be possible for a HMI on a full inspection of a school to be able to get really underneath the skin of what's going wrong to help that school get to good more rapidly. Now, we believe, though, that identifying signs of decline was one thing, but it was a completely different order of expectation to expect inspectors 
I'll try saying that later after a drink, um, to uh, identify, uh, you know, make a qualitative judgment about how good a good school actually is without falling back on published data. Uh, the uh, uh, the Commission concluded, therefore, that the inspectorates were not no longer uh, capable of making judgments of where excellence is in the system and that the outstanding judgment should be removed. Once again, uh, calling on, on Natalie's work at EPI, there is strong evidence now to show that the ability of a school to achieve an outstanding judgment is heavily influenced by the cohort of pupils that attend that school. We also noted that the, uh, the benefit of the outstanding judgment in terms of, of identifying system leaders was also limited. It does not follow that just because you succeeded uh, in one context that you can offer meaningful support to all other leaders and all other schools in all other circumstances. So to sum that up, what we believed was that the inspectorate should focus their attention where they can make the greatest impact, identify failure and, and give that strong insight to schools that are struggling. Focus on getting all schools to good, and it should be the profession that should step forward and support good schools to become great schools. Now, there have been a number of false starts over the last few years to these uh, school-led self-improving system, in part, actually, because the incentives have actually worked against that, encouraging competition where there should be collaboration. But one of the areas which the Commission were particularly interested in was, was the development of peer review arrangements in schools, where all schools regularly engage in, in open, challenging review of their strengths and, and vulnerabilities with one another and focused on school improvement. Now, the benefits... Um, and con contrast to, uh, to inspection is rather obvious. Um, you know, good peer review uh, involves that positive, con you know, collaborative, constructive challenge and support with one another, outside of the shadow of fear that can be cast through high stakes accountability. So, where does this leave us? Well, um, where I'd like to conclude on this is, is by saying, that, well, I'll find the right page if I may. Uh, there we go. Uh, <laughs> that might be a start. Um, Top-down accountability, I really do believe, can help lift a system to great. It's great at, at forcing compliance with a set of criteria. It can help, sorry, lift a system to good, but it can't drive that system on to great. We need to rebalance holding schools to account with helping them to improve. And if we succeed in dialing down on the top-down accountability to government and dialing up on the accountability of the profession to one another, I believe that we can create the conditions in which we can unleash greatness in the system. Thank you. Thank you. And Jeff. Hello, great to see you. Uh, what I'd like to do is to talk about three things. I'm going to try and pick up a number of themes which have said by other people and either agree but mostly disagree with them in order to try and spark a bit of debate when we open this up. I want to talk about accountability in theory. Some of that's been said, so I'll do it really quickly. I want to talk about accountability and the way it plays out in practice. And then in that great spirit of don't bring me problems, bring me solutions, I want to suggest five things we could be doing differently and we can... can kind of test those ideas. So first of all, you've got a system which Ed dismisses because he says it's not really autonomy. The great promise of liberation hasn't actually played out. That's, that's probably true. It doesn't feel like that. But nevertheless, we have an atomised system. Mm -hmm. And when you have an atomised system, what you probably are going to ask to do as, as society is to make sure there are controls in place. And we are in a fledgling system here where those controls have had to be put in place too late. Because the idea of letting everybody off the leash to be able to spend public money in the way that they wanted to has, in some cases, relatively few probably, but they've gained the headlines, led people to doing the kind of things which Ed told us shouldn't be happening. So I think we have to start with an acknowledgement that accountability has to be there because politicians and we as public servants are spending public money. Our problem is that we've allowed accountability to be something defined by other people. It comes from outside. It's an ugly word. It probably doesn't relate to what parents are expecting from school. And as one senior journalist at a well-known broadcasting company said to me today, how would I ever know whether a school is, not, is good or not good in the system? How would you know that? I mean, we get Nick mentioning that 90% of schools are good or outstanding at the moment using Ofsted. Do you believe that? If that is the case, 90%, why is our education system not better? 
How could it possibly be the case that 90% of our schools are good or outstanding when we still have severe pockets of underachievement within schools as well as between schools? So I'm not convinced that you looked at Ofsted necessarily to tell you how good the state of your country's schools are. You certainly don't look at the data. We'll come back to that in a second. So what do you do? Look at international comparisons? Do you really believe that comparing how young people in this country do with how they do in Shanghai or how they're doing in Finland, is that really giving you a like-for-like -like comparison? So in other words, accountability has been allowed to, to build itself into a monster which we think is going to sort all kinds of problems out. It really isn't. Parents probably want their children to go to a school where they know they are going to be safe, they're going to do a broad and balanced curriculum, and they're going to come out ready to take their place as citizens of the future. So one of the things we'll get to at the end is, so how would you build an accountability system, if that's what we're going to call it, which is going to make that more likely rather than less likely to happen? So that's the accountability in theory problem, I think. But the way that then plays out in practice is that you have key stage two tests. And what the key stage two tests do is they say to a child who's had four or five years in their primary school that over four days we're going to test you in your reading and your writing and your maths. Now the stakes are very high because if you're a head teacher and a governing body there, then you will want your school to be perhaps outstanding. So what do you need to do? Well, you need to make sure that those young people are particularly good in their reading, their writing and their maths. That might just mean, in some cases, that what we're seeing is our most outstanding primary schools with the narrowest curriculum. Because the youngsters are not, perhaps in some cases, doing their extracurricular um, sport, or even their curricular sport or the music, they're doing more spelling or whatever it might be. So we have an issue, I think, about the way in which the key stage two tests are trying to reflect things, and, and the report from the NHT very successfully uh, nails the problem there. But then you've got the problem of key stage four, GCSE. Because then five years later, we use GCSEs, which as we've seen from Robert Halfen this week, is a qualification designed in a different era, for a different age when young people were leaving school in many cases, and yet we use it not just to judge the child, but to judge the teacher, to judge the head teacher, to judge the school, and potentially, as we've already heard from Natalie, then to put it into a multi-academy trust, which is untried and untested in terms of whether that is really the solution it wants. So we probably need a key stage for GCSE, which is useful in helping a child with the advice of its parent and the advice of its teacher to make a decision about where they go next. That's probably what you need to do, instead of using it both for uh, the, the inspection judgments being linked to Progress 8. And as we've already heard, Becky mentioned this, Progress 8 is problematic because if you're in the northeast, for example, and your community is white working class, and you're being judged between key stage 2 and key stage 4 in whether your children make progress in English, well, children from white working class families will make slower progress than those who are, losing, who are learning English as their second language. By definition, they will. We're not comparing like with like. And what that does, as, as Nick has pointed out, Natalie's pointed out, in fact everyone's pointed out, is it leads people to be less likely to go and work in the very communities that need them. The communities that ought to have the optimism of what great education does. And in the process, what it does, it makes being a school leader joyless. It takes a lot of the privilege of being a school leader, feel like you're jumping through hoops. And it may just be that what the multi-academy system may have done for some people is to introduce a system whereby you now feel you have to give data, probably bogus data, every six weeks in order to say, this is how this child in this subject has done. And in the process, what we do to the brightest child in year 10 is tell her or tell him, well, you're red rated, you're amber rated, but maybe you're not green rated because you could work even harder. So what does that feel like to be the brightest girl in year 10, being told from every teacher in every subject, every six weeks, nothing is ever good enough? And then we worry about mental health. So all of that is by way of saying this is what the accountability system appears to be doing. And I'll finish by kind of talking about what we might try to do differently. So first of all, let's decide what we think matters in our schools. Natalie's mentioned community leadership. I think it's the most important thing. I think some of our greatest leaders are working in the northeast, for example, in the northwest. They're working in communities that don't have the other infrastructure. They've shrunk away. They are playing a part of the emergency services in those schools, and they are exceptional, and they need to be recognised for that. So what does that mean? Well, maybe what that means is that we ought to be starting to look at a form of inclusive accountability. Accountability which starts with an opening question, so what are you doing for the most vulnerable child in your school? So the child who comes from a background where they never get access to the arts, for example, what can you demonstrate that you're doing for that child? And if there's a child who needs to go to a pupil referral unit in year nine, 
because actually that's going to be best for them. What about if that child's two-thirds of their education in secondary shows up in my school and the rest of it shows up in your school? So that you start to get a sense that what accountability is about is it's about our community. It's about what we are doing for the youngsters in our town, irrespective of where they go and what their background is. And you can see how this might play out in a regional way with regional schools commissioners, because the needs in the Northeast may be different from what we need to do in other places. And maybe we need to be saying, why don't we have a kind of mission for the Northeast, just like we had the London challenge in the past? So there are probably things that we could do in terms of rethinking accountability. We could certainly show that up in a dashboard of data where a school, of course, will be judged on certain things that parents will be interested in, how the children are doing in making progress in the basics. I think most parents will want to know that, but parents will probably want to know other things. But instead of defining that externally, why don't we give that to the leaders to say, we think it's really important, like independent schools have always said it's important, that what we want to show is how many children take part in extracurricular music. And so our dashboard is going to show you that. Because if you're the kind of parent who think it's really important what happens outside the classroom as well as inside the classroom, our dashboard will show you the national stuff. It'll also show you the internal stuff. And my last point is this, and it's to pick up on what every one of these people has said for. It's really easy for us to do what Harold Wilson said, that a child born on a council estate learns as its first sentence. It's the government's fault. Now, when Ed starts talking about the kind of Stalinist view that Nick Gibb brings, or the view of Ofsted, which is a defined political curriculum, well, of course Ofsted is going to do that. And it's not right to make a comparison with the NHS. Because what you're doing with the NHS, you're trying to make people better. But what you're trying to do with education is you're trying to make sure they have the skills and the knowledge, the qualities and the aptitudes which are going to help them to take their place in the future. Society has a huge investment in that. And if we depoliticise education, we give up the most important thing. We have to be involved in the debate. And Nick's peer review point is a good one, but you'll have to persuade parents that we're not going back to the secret garden of people who just go and have cosy chats with each other. All of which is to say that accountability belongs to parents and not to us. And the people who are the good guys in this, potentially, are the big multi-academy trusts, my final point. Because they could say, we're not going to do GCSE, we're going to do IGCSE. They could say, we're going to use peer review and we're going to demonstrate to parents that that does improve schools and we demonstrate that we, finally, after whinging about it, are starting to take real ownership, not just of our education, but also of accountability. That'll do you. Wow. Well, those are fantastically stimulating inputs. Um, I mean, I'm really interested in this, um, you know, potential binary between health and education, because, of course, with the growth and the need for public health, uh, immediately the relevance of education comes into play there, and I think we're going to see much more of that in the future. We've also focused a lot on assessment, um, and we've got a range of very productive and interesting ideas there, which I'm sure we'll debate. Uh, we've had the notion of jettisoning the outstanding Ofsted grade. Uh, we've had the notion of support for uh, unsatisfactory struggling schools. Um, I mean, I know that when I uh, did my 2011 report, unsatisfactory looking at um, the uh, predominance of working class kids uh, represented in schools stuck at this uh, satisfactory grade and um, many of the recommendations were about support for those schools. I was told that, you know, this isn't the role of Ofsted and, and, and actually there wasn't the resource for Ofsted to be supporting satisfactory schools. So this is um, a, an interesting issue. We've got the suggestion about peer review, but of course this isn't blind peer review and I can imagine that there may be dangers about a sort of mutual backpacking and, and, and also, um, well, I won't criticise you if you don't criticise me and so forth. So, so va various challenges there. Um, and again, as I said, I look forward to your questions on this. But what I'm interested about also is that we haven't had um, a great deal of focus on the issues about the complexity of our accountability system now. Um, I'm thinking not just of uh, Ofsted and league tables, but 
the RSCs as well as Ofsted, um, the role of multi-academy trusts, which we've touched on, uh, local authorities still in play with local authority schools, and the enormous complexity uh, that this brings into play. So, uh, so, so I think my first question for the panel is, is the system currently too complex? And if so, what should change? And I'll just put that to Natalie, first of all. Oh, my gosh. Um... Uh, yeah, I think it is too complex. Looking from uh, parents... So, one of the things that I have a lot of debate about um, with... I live in Croydon, which is a diverse South London borough, and Ed's laughing because I always talk about the fact I live in Croydon. Um, and I live... My mind. <laughs> I live in the middle of Croydon, which is... Um, uh, not quite the poorest part of the borough, but definitely not the most affluent part of the borough. And a lot of my friends say to me, um, oh, come and live in the, in the south part of the borough, which is the posh bit, um, because the schools are better. And it's the same thing. Whenever I get into an Uber, the Uber driver says, I'm doing this so I can move out of London and get my kid into a good school. And I'm like, um, hold on one second. Um, <laughs> Parents don't know what they're looking for. They're looking at the top of the table, they're looking at Ofsted judgments, and as Jeff says, we're pointing them in entirely the wrong direction. What they're looking for is, um, it's basically signaling, we're signaling where you have high attaining middle class pupils. Um, and so it's not surprising that, uh, that, that parents are confused because we have a system that's not necessarily measuring the right things or giving them the right information. Or transparent, perhaps. Or transparent, yeah. Anyone else want to jump in on that? Well, yes, it is a confused and complicated system. I go back to my point that it's a fledgling system where the original promise was that you could just get on and run your school. But then the realisation that whether it's the ESFA having to put financial controls on you, or whether actually it was always a bogus promise in a sense, wasn't it? Because the idea was that you'd be able to do whichever curriculum you wanted to. But actually it was management, wasn't it, through the EBAC and management through the qualification system. It seems to me that you probably need something in a fragmented system to bring people together. I think one of the great ideas was always the teaching schools. They were a bizarre name. I think parents must have thought, well, isn't every school a teaching school? But nevertheless, the idea of a teaching school was a good idea. The trouble was they were in the wrong places, not necessarily read, led by the right people. And there are some proposals from the department now. You could see how you could take a system now and say, even if we didn't call the multi-academy trust, why don't we have families of schools, which are essentially saying, I'm going to look beyond just the confines of my own school. We're going to have a teaching school somewhere within it, because the number one issue is we need to get more people to come here. The number two issue is we need to get more people to stay here. We are going to do that collectively using some government resources to be able to do it. And then if you have an accountability system that holds up a mirror to show how well you are doing that, but recognises is it takes time. And, you know, there were, there were three uh, heads in the east of England uh, on GCSE results day uh, who lost their job uh, last year, having, wait for it, started the previous September. Now, you could say that's accountability measures. You could say that's Ofsted, but they don't sag heads. Mm -hmm. Essentially, we've created a culture where we somehow think something as complex as learning can be transformed very quickly. And part of our job, <coughs> I think, is to say to leaders, this will take time. And governors, trustees, this will take time. Let's do the things that are right, and let's have the right kind of measures to show it. And those systems, fewer of them, could help us just to join up the system somewhat. Helpful. I think Ed wanted I mean, to... Je Jeff is exactly talking to the point I was making, is that the accountability structures will be there in some description, um, and it's about the way the profession deals with it and owns it, and then takes it forward that will make a difference. Um, in answer to the original question, I would say it is both too simple and too complicated at the same time. Another paradox, <laughs> it's too simple for the parents, i.e. if a school's outstanding, they want to send their kids there, and if it's not, they don't. But it's too complicated for the teachers and heads, because obviously there's a plethora of different uh, pressures coming from all directions. Um, uh, and that's some mean achievement to have created that system. <laughs> Thank you. Get quick, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, please I'll, do. I'll try and be yeah. quick on it. Um, I think I, I want to pick up on that, that contradiction there because in some ways we've got a very complex system but it's not very sophisticated and in some ways you need a, something which is that little bit more sophisticated. At the moment, 
there is a very simple connection that is made between pupils at this school have not achieved what they were meant to, therefore the school is at fault. And it fails to take into any account the circumstances in which that school finds themselves, and more often than not does not take into account the distance that that school has taken those children. Now surely, surely it has to be possible that the two states of a school is doing everything it could possibly do in the circumstances that it finds itself, and the children have not yet achieved where they, what they need to do. Surely those two states could coexist in the same universe without the universe imploding, and yet that seems to be the problem that we just can't get our head around at the moment. If we can have a system where Ofsted can determine that a school is doing everything that it can, and yet we can still honestly say more needs to be done to get these children to where they need to be, because it is not acceptable to leave children behind, then surely that forces people in power to start looking at what else do we need to do because the answer isn't to kick that school. Mm -hmm. They're doing everything they can do, so what do we need to put behind them mm -hmm. so that they can achieve the very best for those pupils? That's the bit that I don't think we've ever succeeded in, mm -hmm. in, in solving, and it's getting even harder without a middle tier, I would suspect. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nick. Well, at this point, let's turn over to you, the audience. So um, we'll do the usual. If you can introduce yourself and keep your comments as succinct as possible, uh, that will really help us take in as many as possible. So gentlemen here at the front. And then uh, Jean-Louis Dutot, the um, editor of Flip the System UK. Um, I wonder to what extent fiddling with the accountability, accountability system is always going to fail, provided we accept the tenet of competition within the education system. Because for as long as it's competitive, and league tables represent that, then one school is getting its success at the expense of somebody else's. So at what point do we, how do we undermine that idea of competition, replace it with the collaboration that you have all mentioned, I think. That's really helpful. And Nick in the middle there. Just some thoughts really uh, engendered from Nick's comment, which is, do we really think 90% are good or outstanding? It's quite easy to have a system which has 90% good or outstanding. If once people have got an outstanding grade, you then never measure them again. Uh, it's a brilliant political move to ensure that one achieves a totally uh, good and outstanding system. So the question I think that begs then is, having said that the audience felt four years was about right, doesn't that mean it should be all schools? And I take your point, Nick, that you were saying you want to focus the resources on where they matter, but how do we know where they matter when the schools haven't been inspected for 10 yeah. years? Thank you. And do we have one more question in the round before we... Um... Hi, my name's Liz Robinson. I've uh, been ahead for 13 years in a very challenged school in South East London. I'm now jointly run a mat called Big Education with uh, School 21 in Stratford. We're trying to change the, change the world. Uh, Loads, I could comment for about 10 minutes, but I won't. Uh, two things I wanted to say. I mean, I think to me it really goes back to the point of what is the point? What is the purpose? We talk about regulation, so uh, the other thing I just wanted to say about regulation in general is that you haven't, nobody's talked about the fact that um, audit and ESFA financial regulation, you know, to take your point, there's certain, we're accountable for public money and people often talk about Ofsted as being about accountability, which it kind of isn't. You know, there, there's financial propriety and particularly as Matt's, um, it feels for me, having just become the accounting officer of a MAT, feels much tighter than anything I experienced in 13 years as a local authority. No, but it's much tighter, and that's a good thing. I, I welcome it. But, you know, so regulation is about more than just Ofsted. Um, of, Ofsted is a, is a quality, a qualitative judgment. Um, so what's the point of it? Is it about, I mean, totally agree with your point, that largely, to my eyes, it's about a very potent, powerful brand, and it fully understands, and I would say is addicted to its potency as a brand. It's about informing parental choice. Uh, and so I totally agree that that's the, that's the predominant driver for it, and I don't think it's a particularly useful or, um, tool for doing that, but that, that largely is its point. Um, I just wanted to make uh, two other quick points. One is... Very, very quick, quickly. Okay. <laughs> one, one is just, you know, I, I put my hand up to say never that schools should be inspected. Um, and that's not that I don't think schools should be held to account, but I just think the model is fundamentally wrong because it deeply disempowers school leaders um, to, okay. to, to put the locus of control into an inspectorate 
and uh, not in any way uh, properly acknowledged. And the fact that we still think about peer review as being something that's, um, you know, backslapping, mm. uh, when actually the kind of rigour of the processes that are being um, implemented across the country now are, are really counter to that. So I think that's something we should take much more seriously. Thank you very much. They're really good questions. Um, so we've got um, the first point is about uh, competition. Jeff, did you want to say something about that? Yes, uh, s certainly. Um, I think we want to be a little bit careful about this idea that competition is necessarily bad. When uh, Labour introduced its specialist school uh, scheme, essentially what they were doing was to say, choose what's distinctive about your school. Um, and use that to drill into your school, to develop your school. We were a sports college uh, where we were in East Anglia. Next door there was a science college. Now, in one sense, what you were essentially getting as a child wasn't that different, but there was some difference there. And a level of competition between head teachers has always existed. You keep an eye on what the newsletter next door is like and how they're presenting themselves. It seems to me that isn't a bad thing at all. But what you need underpinning it is a sense that your responsibilities are not just for those young people in your own community. And that's why I would go back to my earlier point about whether you're a local authority school, a mat, a selective school, an independent school. Could we take responsibility more broadly and be able to then say, here's what we as a community of leaders have done with teachers on behalf of the community of young people. Thank you. Do you want to yes, can I Please. come on that point? I've always liked, you know, have my cake and eat it and talk about competitive collaboration. Uh, you know, it's, there's nothing wrong with being competitive. You know, teachers are, uh, are competitive people. Um, you want to do the very best, but that shouldn't be at the expense of other people. Now, one approach which, uh, which we discussed on the Commission, and it, it, it didn't make it to the final cut because we proposed that outstanding judgment should be removed, was, was a proposal which said that, well, actually, should any school be allowed to be outstanding if there is a school down the road that is struggling and they're doing nothing to help it? Now, that's an interesting challenge, isn't it? That would suddenly change the dynamics within the system if you can only succeed if everyone around you is succeeding also. Um, can I comment on the, 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 the next point about 90% good mm. or, or better? Well, good, very good question. What is the actual percentage? And, and, and surely, uh, you know, this is what the Ofsted current framework consultation should really be all about, isn't it? That we, as a profession, agree what a definition of good looks like, and then the inspectorate go out and tell us how many schools match that definition. Currently, they say it's 90%. Uh, but, you know, you know, that may well change if our view of what good looks like changes also. Um, our commission report, report also said that all schools should be inspected. It's not right, surely. Very few people would argue that there are over, you know, the fact that now over 300 schools previously outstanding that haven't been inspected for over 10 years. That's, very few people will, 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 will stand behind that as being a sensible way forward. All schools should be inspected. We think that you know, it's schools which aren't struggling should have a very light touch experience of that. And when the question then comes as to sort of how often should those inspections be, well, frankly, if they're not damaging, if they're fair, proportionate, reliable, uh, and, and do not have the same high stakes as the current system, well, frankly, how often can you get round? Uh, <laughs> you know, if, you know if, as well as, as if, if these, these, these inspections for schools that are struggling can give you good, solid advice, which can help you to get to good more rapidly. So you could turn that one right on its head if you wanted to. Thanks, Nick. Natalie? Um, just come back quickly on a couple of point so on competition and collaboration um, exactly uh, that's exactly the direction I think we should be going I don't have um, the solution um, part of the problem is that progress eight is a zero-sum game so you help the school down the road and you by definition hmm. compromise your own results um, I like the idea of um, of, um, uh, of schools, as Jeff said, retaining responsibility for pupils, even if they go to an alternative provision or a different school. Um, and then somehow building up a sense of the area needing support. So if pupils in an area are struggling, let's target intervention and support in that area rather than punish individual schools, because that then becomes a zero-sum game as well. Um, very quickly on the Ofsted outstanding point, completely agree. The other part of the research that I, uh, I talked about earlier is that we found that lots of schools had that were outstanding had deteriorated but hadn't been prioritised for reinspection. But under a good Ofsted model and a light touch model, um, I run three school, primary schools in the small map that I'm a director of. One is outstanding. I'm more than happy for Ofsted to come back every day if they want. 
Um, I've got one that is RI, and we're doing everything in our power to improve it. And so, you know, I'm, you know, we're, I wouldn't say we're ready for Ofsted to come back, but if Ofsted come back and they're really helpful and informative, then great. I've got no problem with that. <laughs> Thanks, Natalie. And Ed. Um, <clears throat> that's exactly the point, isn't it? You know, if Ofsted and the accountability system, accountability system was doing what it should then you should you could be a failing school and you should welcome Ofsted coming through the door every day to support you. But obviously that's kind of cloud cuckoo land. Um, to JL's point, uh, there has always been competition in the system, even before league tables, even before Baker. Um, I'm sort of too old, for, too young to remember, except I sort of do. An old primary head once said to me, you know, be careful what you wish for in terms of abolishing league tables because Pre to, prior to 88, uh, you were judged based on hearsay at the school gate. That was the only way you were judged. Schools were still judged to be failing or succeeding, but it was based on gossip. So in fact, for some primary heads, league tables were welcome at the time. Now, it's probably gone too far the other way. But it has always been a zero-sum game in a local area about failing and succeeding, whether there's competition or not. Um, so that, that is my only point about that, is that you know, while there are individual entities that are schools, there will be some competition, as pretty much all, that, all the panellists have said. And to Tony's point, um, I don't know anyone in education, including everyone at Ofsted and everyone at the DfE, who doesn't think that outstanding schools should be inspected. Let's have another round of questions. Hands. A couple on this side. My name's Nani, I work for the Robertson Foundation um, as a researcher. The, it's almost quite frustrating listening to the wealth of ideas, most of which are not contradictory, that the panel has come up with to improve the accountability, the accountability system as it exists. What it makes me think is, why has none of that wealth of both research evidence and practical professional knowledge not gone into the design of the system as it is and what can we do as you know a large group of members of civil society school leaders researchers who do have power to at the very least make statements about this to to inculcate some kind of change in that direction thank you hi it's sally holt from the brilliant club um, there's a, a lot of discussion at the moment about sense of place and geography. Um, yesterday, the Bridge Group published um, a report on um, geographical disadvantage um, in progression to higher education. I was just wondering, a lot of these things that we have discussed kind of hi have highlighted place. Thank you, Jeff, for that. Um, but there's often a sense that in London and places with additional resources um, external to the education system, that we're able to draw on a lot more. And how do we make sure that sense of place and community isn't a race to the bottom or just leaves communities um, unable to access these things and to bring themselves up? How do we recognise sense of place? Thank you. Um, colleagues, want to jump in? Yeah, I'll do both, both of those, if that's right. So first of all... if we can keep it short, we'll get more yeah, questions. Yeah, so if, if, we, if, if we've got all these good ideas, why have they not happened? Well, partly because we have a political system whereby a, a new minister, a new team comes into office with their wacky wheezes and they're implemented and then they're kind of built on top. Now, I, I think we've reached a point where there is recognition politically that we cannot carry on like this. More teachers are leaving teaching than are joining teaching at the moment. We cannot contain this. According to the TES, we're going to need 47,000 more teachers by 2024, even if none of those secondary teachers left. That focuses the mind, I think, somewhat. And I think we are starting to see an increasing number of people, including parents, who, who are showing that they don't give a fig about most of this accountability stuff, which is using so much money. Some of this is down to leaders now being bolder. We're the ones who allow Ofsted posters to be outside our rooms claiming that we are outstanding. This place will have regulators who will come and do its food hygiene and its health and safety and so on, and you won't see great banners outside boasting about it. There are certain ways in which we could put Ofsted back in its box. We could, with the new proposals around Ofsted when they're proposing to come in the day before, 
which is spooking everybody because the idea is, is it going to start an inspection earlier? But if you listen to Sean Harford, the idea is, could we co-construct an inspection by having a professional dialogue? Now, because of what we've been through with inspection, everybody is terrified of it. We need, I think, to start being a bit bolder and for us to feel that we are putting the ideas out there and making them happen. And one last thing, and having some kind of political moratorium so that for the next 10 years after we've got it right, no changes, just let teachers teach and leaders lead. Sorry, Becky. Natalie. Um, so on that point, I, I agree with Jeff. I think that we are now seeing a, uh, a shift in um, what the, how the department and government are viewing accountability and taking a broader measure. We've seen that in the um, draft Ofsted framework. I would like to think it's because of the three years that EPI have been putting out research. Um, <laughs> <laughs> others might disagree. <laughs> um, but yeah, new government comes in, they have their ambitions, and it's very rare that you'll see an immediate step change. Um, in terms of recognising self uh, sense of place, again, that's a notion I completely support. Up until um, last year, the government had 12 opportunity areas, none of which were in the northeast, which was Barmy at the time. And now they do have a sort of quasi opportunity area in the northeast. Um, <laughs> But, um, yeah, I think the more we can do to, uh, to promote that sense of uh, uh, place and community, the better. Thank you, Natalie. Ed, I'm so, sorry, Nick. <laughs> Did you want to come in? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I will do that. Um, how can we, we make this stuff happen? Well, you know, for too long, I think we actually we, we've been guilty of shouting at walls, that we, we point to the problems, but we don't come up with, with pragmatic, sensible solutions. That's precisely what we have been doing. That's precisely what this Accountability Commission was all about, was attempting not to just be sensationalist and say, isn't it all awful, but come up with, with sensible proposals that can happen. Now, they already are happening. The, the consultation published a week or two ago around abolishing floor and coasting standards quoted and referenced the Improving School Accountability, Accountability Commission report as one of the recommendations. Uh, we're well on the way on building credibility around peer review and we've been bringing together the major providers of peer review nationally to say how can we take this to scale. The point here is it is in our hands to act on this. We don't need to wait for permission from government to act. We can step forward and into the space, frankly, that we want to be vacated by Ofsted and show that we can be trusted to work to one another, to be, be strong in our challenge of one another and to have the very highest aspirations for the pupils in our schools. And unless we step into that, well, more fullness. Thank you. And Ed? Um, <clears throat> to the point about civil society, I think there are signs driven, uh, as Jeff alluded to, by the recruitment and retention crisis that the government is prepared to listen to the profession more than it has done for a number of years. And I think there are signs that the profession is taking that opportunity. Uh, the union leadership on both the heads and classroom unions, I think, is very positive at the moment. I think the College of Teaching is good. I think the social media conversation is positive. I think if you look at, it's not about accountability, but if you look at the way that the early careers framework was generated, the stuff that came out three weeks ago, widely praised. Um, that had a, a number of different authors, a number of different inputs from a very large range of different organisations, and, uh, and many of them being heads and teachers and people uh, who, who know what's going on on the ground. So that is a good pointer, I hope, to something positive going forward. Um, I worry a bit about the place thing, actually. I think there can be a risk of inward-looking uh, stuff, inward-looking approaches to education. I worry that, uh, that we'll give ownership of the education debate to local industry um, and schools will start uh, writing their curriculum and, their, and the choices they make about qualifications based on so-called needs of industry um, and will actually lead to shrinking of horizons um, when schools should obviously be about broadening horizons. Um, and also the experience of one school is very different even to another school, even if it's only 300 yards away. Uh, and I worry uh, that it will drive that kind of inward-looking thing. So places, I think, is to be treated guardedly. Thank you, colleagues. Um, we're distressingly low on time. I feel like the debate has probably only just begun. Do, do continue with it, of course, on social media. And talking of which, um, we had a poll uh, before, before this debate uh, on Twitter, which asked, within our school system, is the level of, of accountability either too high, about right, or too low? And perhaps not surprisingly, over 70%, 72% said 
too high. 11% said about right, and 17%, interestingly, said too low. Um, in response to that, there have been various uh, uh, responses, including um, what Michael Newman saying, what an incredibly loaded political question. <laughs> and we've also had a, a range of comments talking particularly about the need to, uh, um, to um, fund better uh, the school system and, and the attention to accountability um, and, and the issues that are, are, are driving teachers away from, uh, uh, from education. Education. Um, indicative here is uh, Dan Glenhorn on Facebook saying, Why do we need CEOs in education when budget deficits are crippling schools? So you can see the tenor of the debate that's going on on social media. Um, what I think has been great about this uh, um, debate has been twofold. First of all, um, we've had a lot of dilemmas and even binaries raised in various ways uh, um, by our panellists, and we really need to map these, I think, in order to analyse them. Perhaps that's uh, part, of, part of your report. Um, but it is a complicated issue. Um, but I think the fantastic thing has been that both from the uh, panel as well as from the audience, we've had a whole range of solutions as well as problems. And I think the points that have been made about the profession taking ownership of this area are absolutely well made. So let's finish on that note. Thank you for coming.